Um, guys, so you just saw a snapshot of what we've covered so far. We have inflation, international trade and balance of payment completed. We are on the final topic which is exchange rates. Your handout would have been uploaded to you. This is a rather thick handout. It's our final topic. It is the longest topic in macro and um, perhaps a little more challenging than the other ones. So we're not going to do this in one sitting. We're going to do this in roughly three or four sittings. The first sitting, which is today, will cover all the way up to floating exchange rates. Okay, so that's what you're going to be responsible for. Um, you'll see as it comes, as you progress with the handout, that today's uh, lesson will end when we finish floating exchange rates. All right, so um, you need to have the handout in front of you. Unfortunately, this topic calls for a lot of diagrams, which you will notice as you turn over. There's lots of spaces that I've left for the diagram. So you need to, when you are watching this video, have this handout in front of you and draw the diagram simultaneously with me. Uh, if this involves pausing the video and making sure you have the diagrams correct, please feel free to do that. But this is what I would require you to do. Okay, so this is handout number 10, exchange rates, and the final topic for our AS level syllabus, after which we are going to proceed into a very, very um, regimented revision schedule, where I will be giving you data responses, MCQ papers, etc. to be solving. Okay, so let's start exchange rates. Um, I think everyone is aware of this, a country's exchange rate is the value of their currency in terms of another currency. It is the external value of a country's currency. You can underline the word external, external value of a country's currency. So exchange rates is something hopefully that we are all familiar with. For example, um, there's been a lot of fluctuation in the rupee to the dollar, um, start settling at about 155. So we know what an exchange rate is, 155 rupees to one dollar, the value of our currency in terms of another the currency okay um, this word external value of the currency is quite important because this helps you differentiate it from the internal value of a currency um, there's a question in which there's going to be an overlap between the two so we're going to discuss that but just remember the internal value of your currency is your inflation rate the external value of your currency is your exchange rate I'm going to repeat that once more the internal value of your currency is your inflation rate the external value is your exchange rate. Um, let us take the example of the UK. We are looking at the UK's exchange rate with the US. So now, you have a diagram in front of you. Before we go any further, I'd like you to draw this grid, and I would also like you to understand this grid. So we are looking at this from the UK's point of view, and the reason I know that is I put quantity of pounds on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I have put dollars per pound. Per pound, how many dollars can you receive? So this number down here, one dollar, means that if I take my one pound onto the Forex, Forex stands for foreign exchange, Forex market, and I hand them one pound, they will give me one dollar in return. On the other hand, all the way up here, we have two dollars as our value. <clears throat> two dollars means if I take that very same pound to the Forex market and I exchange it, this time I am going to get two dollars in return. I need you to understand what all of these numbers are. This is dollars per pound. It is you taking one pound of your currency, you're living in the UK. You take one pound of your currency and you take it to the foreign exchange market, your forex market. In our country, you have Mars, you have Western Union, any place you can exchange your currency. Down here, this one dollar means that per pound I take to the forex market, I receive one dollar in return. After the number is two dollars, what does this mean? Per pound I take to the forex market, now I receive two dollars in return. Okay, so this is what I want you to draw. Pause the video right now. I want you to draw this axis, UK, quantity pounds, dollars per pound, starting from one, ending at two. In this empty space that is given over here, I want you to draw this framework and this grid. <clears throat> and make sure you pause the video and get this down properly. Um, before we proceed any further, we need to understand why there is a demand and supply of currency on the forex market. So this is an important part. Why is there a demand for your currency and why is there a supply of your currency? Um, Alright, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to draw in the demand and supply curves. I'm going to draw in the demand and supply curves. And then I'm going to show you what the demand and supply of this currency stands for. Okay, 
So I've drawn in the demand and supply curves that look like regular demand and supply curves. Our demand curve is like downward sloping, our supply curve is upward sloping. So you can add that into your diagram or you're welcome to wait and add it right at the end when we come up with an equilibrium exchange rate. All right. In the, example, in the above example, the demand for pounds is by US citizens who wish to buy goods and services from the UK. Essentially, the demand for pounds represents a demand for UK exports. Now, I need you to understand this. Why are people on the forex market demanding pounds? Local residents do not demand their own currency. We don't go to Western Union and demand our own currency. It is other people. We go to, if, if I need money, right, I will go to my bank and take out money for groceries. I won't go to Western Union and take out money for groceries. It is not a local demand for money. The demand for money comes from international, internationally on the forex market. If we take the example of two countries, the UK and the US, the demand for pounds is not by UK residents themselves, but it is rather by US residents. And why would US residents demand UK currency if they wish to buy goods and services from the UK? We need to understand this, this is very important. The only reason that US residents will demand this currency is if they wish to buy goods and services from the UK. What does this mean? If US residents are buying goods and services from the UK, this is the UK's export. The UK is exporting these goods to the US. The US is buying goods from the UK, which from UK's point of view is considered a UK export. So I'd like to see what I'm writing over here. The demand for pounds is by US residents, not UK residents, but by US residents for UK exports. Every time somebody wants to buy a good or service from the UK, they will demand pounds. If your family is planning on taking a trip to the UK, they will need pounds. So they will go to the forex market and demand pounds. So the demand for pounds is by US in our example or foreign residents who wish to buy goods and service from the services from the UK, which is considered a UK export. So this is why you have it all over here. Essentially, the demand for pounds represents a demand for UK exports. Um, on the other hand, the supply of pounds on the forex market is by UK residents themselves. They will supply pounds onto the forex market in exchange for other currencies. They do so if they wish to buy goods and services from other countries. In this example, UK residents will supply pounds onto the forex market in exchange for dollars if they wish to buy US produced goods and services. In essence, they supply pounds if they wish to import US produced goods and services. The supply of pounds represents the demand for UK imports. Note that the supply of the currency represents a demand for imports. Now I need you to understand this. This was a little more straightforward. Demand for pounds is by foreign residents for UK produced goods and services. Demand for pounds is a demand for UK exports. But why would UK residents go to the forex market and supply their currency? Why would you as a Pakistani go to a forex market like Western Union or any exchange center and supply your currency? You supply your currency if you wish to buy other currencies. Think about what I'm saying. You supply your currency if you wish to buy other currencies. Why are you buying other currencies? In the simplest form, you are buying other currencies because you are demanding goods or services from their country. Um, my family wants to take a vacation to Thailand. I will supply rupees onto the forex market and buy Thai baht. Why am I doing this? Because I wish to buy goods and services from another country, which is Thailand. In our example, who is supplying pounds? The pound is being supplied by UK residents themselves. So we write over here, buy UK residents. You will be writing all of this on your handout, please, or write it right at the end when you're done. <clears throat> the supply of pounds is by UK residents. But why are they supplying pounds onto the international market? Because they wish to buy goods and services from other countries. From the UK's point of view, this is a demand for imported items. From the UK's point of view, this is a demand for imported items. So here, the demand for pounds is for UK exports. The supply of pounds is actually for UK imports. So here's something we need to understand, which is put a word over here. The supply of pounds represents the demand for imports. You supply your currency when you are demanding goods and services from other countries. I find, I find that often students find this easy to understand. Demand for pounds, demand for exports. 
Just remember, supply of pounds, demand for imports. Supply of pounds represents a demand for imports. Demand and demand go together, but we need to understand the supply here is representing a demand for imports. So guys, again, I just want to recap. Before we go any further to even try and establish what an exchange rate is, you need to understand why currencies are demanded and supplied on the forex market, the foreign exchange market. And here's your answer in front of you. If we take UK as our base country, the demand for pounds represents, or rather is by US residents for UK exports, whereas the supply of pounds is by UK residents themselves for UK imports, for goods and services they wish to import from other countries. All right, um, just a small note over here, just to make you understand in case this shows up in MCQs, <clears throat> the demand for pounds will be downward sloping as at lower exchange rates, goods and services from the UK will seem cheaper to US residents. We need to explain the downward sloping nature of this curve. Why does the demand for pounds slope downwards? Um, very simple to understand. Let's say a UK export costs one pound. I am exporting this marker and this marker in my currency costs one pound. If exchange rates were up here, that one pound would exchange for two dollars. So what does this mean? Every time a US resident wanted to buy this marker of mine, they would need to pay me two dollars. That would be the price in US dollars. However, this is important to understand. This marker still costs one pound in UK pounds, in Great Britain pounds. If the exchange rate was down here, just one dollar, then this marker would cost a US citizen simply one dollar. The price of this marker changes in US dollars depending on the exchange rate. Let me repeat that. This marker costs one pound. Up here, it's costing a US citizen two dollars. Down here, it is only costing a US citizen one dollar because that is the exchange rate dollars to pounds. One pound can get two dollars up here, and we'll get one dollar down here. Similarly, reverse it. To buy a pound, a US resident needs two dollars up here. He needs one dollar down here. One dollar is cheaper. More will be demanded at a lower price as compared to a higher price. Law of demand states that more will be demanded at a lower price as compared to a higher price. And similarly, the supply curve slopes upwards for the same reason. Um, as the pound gets stronger, less and less pounds will be required to purchase a given UK export. The US export, sorry, I, I, said, I said it wrong over there. As the pound gets stronger, less and less pounds will be required to purchase a given US export. The exports will seem cheaper in terms of UK pounds. For example, if a US export costs $2, at lower exchanges it will cost the UK residents £2. However, at a higher rate of exchange, it will cost the UK residents only £1. Again, Let's say a US export costs $2. I want to buy this duster from the US. In US dollars, this duster costs $2. If the exchange rate was down here, I would need two pounds. One dollar is one pound, so two dollars would be two pounds. This duster would cost me two pounds in my currency. On the other hand, if the exchange rate was up here, one pound is two dollars, then this duster which costs two dollars would only cost me one pound. This duster costs two dollars, down here it will cost me two pounds, down here it will only cost me one pound with the difference in the exchange rate. I hope everyone understands that. One pound is one dollar, so two dollars is two pounds. Here two dollars is only one pound. As my currency is getting stronger, goods and services from other countries are going to seem cheaper to me because their price hasn't changed but the amount of my currency that I require will keep on going down. Their price hasn't changed but the amount of my currency required to buy it will keep on going down as my currency gets stronger. Similarly, again, and this is important to understand, see what I have written over here, they will demand more of the export as the pound gets stronger, hence supplying more of their currency. I need you to understand this link between demand and supply. Okay? They would demand more of the export as the pound gets stronger, hence supplying more of their currency. I will be buying more dusters if dusters are getting cheaper, hence I will supply more of my currency at higher rates as compared to lower rates. So again guys, um, this, these two paragraphs may have been more for MCQs, but just to make you understand that our demand and supply for the currency follows the regular shape of demand and supply curves, where the demand curve slopes downwards and the supply curve slopes upwards. The reason being is given in these two paragraphs. 
And again, just to recap, the demand for our currency, let's say from the UK, the demand for pounds is by US residents for UK exports. The supply of pounds is by UK residents for UK imports. UK exports, UK imports. Um, the next step should be quite apparent to everybody. Any time a demand and supply curve intersect, what do we look for? We look for the point of intersection, which we've called the price so far. But in this topic, we call it the exchange rate. Where the demand for your currency and the supply of your currency intersect, this is what is going to be known as your equilibrium exchange rate. In our example, our equilibrium exchange rate is one pound is equal to dollars 1.60. We have come up with an equilibrium exchange rate where the demand and the supply of our currency will intersect. Okay, so um, just turn the page, please. An equilibrium exchange rate is one where the demand and supply curves of the currency intersect. In the exam above example, one pound is equal to dollars 1.60. If the exchange rate is set above this value, there will be a surplus of pounds and therefore a downward pressure on the currency. Can everyone see that? What happens if I set my currency at 1.80? Look here. What happens if I set my currency at 1.80? The supply of pounds will be much greater than the demand for pounds. UK residents taking advantage of the stronger currency will be supplying more of their currency to buy goods and services from other countries. They will seem cheaper. However, anybody abroad will not want as much of the currency because suddenly the goods and services from the UK will seem more expensive. There will be a surplus which leads to a downward pressure. Similarly, at lower exchange rates, there's going to be a shortage. As the exchange rate falls lower, the demand for pounds will be very high. People will be demanding this currency a lot at this lower exchange rate. However, not many UK residents will be willing to supply their currency at such a low exchange rate. There will be a shortage and therefore an upward pressure. Um, you're welcome to draw this out. I'm just going to leave this really neat and clean over here. But you're welcome to draw this out in your own handout. Anything of above will lead to a surplus. Anything below will lead to a shortage. Um, this is a diagram you have in your demand and supply notes. It's, all, it's exactly the same thing really. Um, you already have a shortage and a surplus diagram in your notes. It's going to apply over here as well. Um, I hope everybody understands this. It's fairly straightforward. And where the two meet is an equilibrium rate of exchange. So hopefully everybody should be able to do that. And also, just if you haven't drawn the diagram yet, this is a good time to pause your uh, video and make sure you have this exact diagram with all of these things written with 1.6 as your equilibrium exchange rate where the demand and the supply curves intersect. All right, so do take a moment and pause if you need to. And please make sure that you have all of this information in the first page of your handout in the space that is given. Draw the grid, draw the demand, draw the supply, label this, and label this as your equilibrium exchange. So do pause if you need to. Um, exchange rates are reciprocal. What does this mean? If one pound is equal to one dollar, I can easily say that one dollar is equal to pounds one over 1.60, which I've already done the math, is 0 0.625. So we can, if I know that one pound is equal to dollars one, I know that one dollar is equal to pounds 0 0.625. This is important for MCQs. Sometimes you get the answer in the other currency. So let's say you've calculated equilibrium as one pound is dollars 1.60, but you don't see that in the MCQ answers. Look to make sure they haven't switched it. Okay, so one dollar, and I write this over here also. Therefore, dollars one is equal to pounds 0 0.625. I'll put a little box around it. Remember, you can work it both ways just by simple math. Everyone okay with this? That working is done in your handout. Um, all right, currency values can and do change. If a currency becomes stronger, we say that it is appreciated or appreciation has turned, taken place. Underline that term, appreciation. It's a term that you need to know very well. If your currency is getting stronger, we say your currency is appreciating or appreciation has changed place. Um, if you notice there is a blank over here and I want you to just Obviously, if we were in class, I would ask you for your feedback to give me a number. But since we don't, um, since we're not, you could just think about it for one second before I give you the answer over here. Um, can I use this part of the board? All right. So, um, for example, the first example we have is we've been working with these numbers. One pound is equal to dollars 1.60. Now, if appreciation has taken place, 
what can you tell me? How much will one pound be worth? This is what I need you to, uh, to understand before I give you the answer. I want you to think about if the pound is getting stronger or we say the pound has appreciated, what number should I put over here to show you that the pound is getting stronger? Well, the example I can use is 1.80. Per pound, I'm able to get more US dollars now. So in that case, we say the pound has appreciated. Similarly, and this is all in your notes, um, for example, if we have the same numbers as before, we can say that depreciation has taken place. What does depreciation mean? But the pound is getting weaker. It is not as strong as it was before. If a similarity currency becomes weaker, we say that depreciation has taken place or the currency has depreciated. Again, guys, please work alongside with me. I need you to be thinking about this. In a classroom setting, I wouldn't have put these numbers down. I would have asked you to generate these numbers. So please make sure you are doing that. Okay, um, if one pound was worth dollars 1.60 and we now know that the pound has depreciated or become weaker, what number should I put over here? For appreciation, I made my currency get stronger. Per pound, I have one pound in my pocket. Per pound, I used to be able to get dollars 1.6. Now for that same point, that same pound, I'm getting dollars 1.8. So my currency has become stronger. What number should I put over here to show you, show me that my currency has become weaker? One pound was fetching me $1.6. Now, because of depreciation, one pound is only fetching me, for example, $1.4. Okay, it is bringing me less than it was before in terms of another currency. So this is appreciation and depreciation. These numbers are there and I want you to fill them out. Hopefully you would have thought about it before you had the answer given to you just to make you think and understand. Uh, and a final note, just on this, before we move on to a floating exchange rate, if one currency is appreciating, it means the other currency has to be depreciating. Please understand the reciprocal nature of exchange rates. If one currency is appreciating, it automatically means that the other currency is depreciating. If the pound is getting stronger, it means the dollar is getting weaker. And how can I use these numbers to prove that? In order to buy one pound, I only needed dollars 1.6. Now I need dollars 1.8. My currency has become weaker. This is an appreciation of the pound, but a depreciation of the dollar. You must understand this. Similarly, now if my pound has depreciated, earlier I needed 1.6 dollars to buy one pound. Now I only need 1.4 dollars to buy one pound. So if the pound has depreciated, it means the dollar has appreciated. This reciprocal nature of appreciation and depreciation is taken for granted in MCQs. You need to understand this. If one currency is appreciating, automatically the other currency is depreciating. If I say the dollar has, a, a, or rather the rupee has depreciated against the dollar, it means the dollar has appreciated against the rupee. It's a reciprocal nature, it does not change, okay? Uh, so as written over here, note that the depreciation of one currency means an appreciation of the other. If the pound depreciates, it means the dollar has appreciated. So guys, this brings us to the end of our introduction. Again, I'm just going to show you a snapshot of the board that we've done so far. All of this information needs to be in your handout. You guys need to be a little responsible about this. Don't say, okay, I've just watched the video, I'll put it in later. Please pause the video draw this diagram, everything that we are going to do past this point is going to be based on these demand and supply curves. So you need to understand them. What does the demand represent? What does the supply represent? Demand by US residents for UK exports. Supplies by UK residents for UK imports. This is going to be very important a little bit later. Where the two intersect gives us an equilibrium exchange rate. Um, you can look at it both ways. One pound is dollars 1.6 or one dollar is pound 0.625 by simple mathematical division. I've introduced the terms appreciation and depreciation to you. Appreciating pound means that it's getting stronger. A depreciating pound means that it's getting weaker. I can buy less of the currency over here. I can buy more of another currency here. And again, the reciprocal nature comes in. If one currency appreciates like the pound, it means the dollar is depreciating. If one currency depreciates like the pound, it means the dollar is appreciating. This information will be assumed in MCQs. Okay, so you must understand this. So that's the introduction so far, and I'm just going to erase the board, and we move on to another type of the type of exchange rate regimes. 
All right, guys. Um, so now we're moving on to the next part of the handout. As you notice, I have a lot of diagrams on the board. I'll tell you where to put each of them with the changes necessary that you will have to make. All right. So don't get overwhelmed by the um, insane amount of stuff on the board. We'll go through it one by one. Uh, we're moving on to the next part. So we've done a basic background about the demand and supply curves for the currency. What is appreciation, depreciation, equilibrium? Why there's a demand? Why there's a supply? This is all just a basic understanding of exchange rates to help us move forward. Uh, the new, uh, or rather the next part of the handout is called types of exchange rate regimes. And there's going to be three regimes that we are going to study, which is a floating exchange rate, a fixed exchange rate, and something called a managed float. So today's lesson will end at floating exchange rate because there is a lot of information, a lot of diagrams that you need to draw and I don't want to overburden you in one lesson. So we will just do floating exchange rates today. If you were in class, this is what we would have covered in one day, the background and floating exchange rates. So again, guys, as you can see, there are going to be many, many, many diagrams to draw. I know this is a less than ideal situation and you will have to keep pausing your uh, video to put in the diagrams, but again, I urge you, don't say, let me watch the whole video and put the diagrams in later when I'm free. Um, as you're doing this, as you're listening, as you're understanding, pausing it, putting it on, seeing which direction the curves are shifting, I cannot tell you how imperative this will be for your learning. And rest assured when I tell you this information is tested extremely often in data responses and MCQs. Okay, so make sure that you have your pencil ready, make sure you have your um, uh, like I said, I always prefer two colors so you can see the changes easily. So just make sure you have all this information in front of you before we proceed with types of exchange rate regimes. Okay. So the first one we're studying is a freely floating exchange rate. Um, as the name suggests, this is when there is no government intervention whatsoever in the exchange rate market. The country's exchange rate is purely determined by market forces of demand and supply of the currency. Hence, any change in these demand and supply conditions will cause the currency to appreciate or depreciate. Um, super easy to understand conceptually. If my government chooses to adopt a freely floating exchange rate, this means they are not interfering in the exchange rate market and they are letting the exchange rate get determined by market forces of demand and supply, like I told you before. So anytime, again, like the price of every good we've studied in microeconomics. So anytime these market forces of demand and supply change, your exchange rate will change accordingly. So the next part of the lesson, for what we're going to do is show you reasons why the demand and supply curve of my currency may change. Um, you will see how easy this is to lend themselves to MCQs. Your MCQs will come of this nature, what will happen if, which direction, what is the new curve, the same grid I told you before that we've done in micro. All of this lends itself very, very, very well to MCQ questions. Okay. So um, here we are going to start studying reasons why the demand and supply conditions of the currency changes causing the exchange rate to change as well. So over here you have number one written relative inflation rates and the example I've given is if the UK experiences a rate of inflation higher than that of its trading partners. So here's the currency so far, this is the diagram corresponding to number one. Here's the currency so far, your demand, your supply, your equilibrium. And suddenly inflation becomes a huge problem in the UK. The UK is experiencing extremely high rates of inflation as compared to its trading partners. What will happen to its currency? Well, all UK produced goods and services are now becoming very expensive. Let me repeat that. All UK produced goods and services are now becoming very expensive. People in the US will not want to buy them. People in the US will not want to buy UK produced goods and services as they are becoming more expensive. Which curve will that affect and why? Which curve will that affect and why? But if you just turn back and you'll we'll see, the demand for pounds represents a demand for exports. The demand for pounds is representing a demand for exports. So if people don't want to buy UK produced goods and services anymore, they will not demand the pound as much as they did before. They were only demanding the pound to buy goods and services from the UK. If the UK is experiencing an extremely high rate of inflation, Citizens from the US or residents of the US will not want to buy goods and services from the UK. This demand for pounds is going to drop down. People will not want to buy UK produced goods and services and therefore they will not demand as many pounds as before. Um, similarly, as we've already discussed, the supply of pounds represents a demand for imported items. The supply of pounds represents a demand for imported items. If I'm sitting in the UK, and my home produced goods and services are becoming more expensive. 
US produced goods and services are going to seem relatively cheaper. Let me repeat that. If I am sitting in the UK and my home produced goods and services are becoming more and more expensive due to a high rate of inflation, suddenly US produced goods and services are going to seem a whole lot cheaper. I would rather start importing more from the US than consuming my own home produced goods. I would rather import cheaper items from the US than consume home produced UK goods that are becoming very expensive due to inflation. If I want to import more, I will supply more of my currency. If I want to import more, the supply of pounds represents the demand for imports. So if I want to import more, I will be supplying more and more of my currency onto the international market. Let me repeat this once more, and I really need you guys to understand this. We're talking about reasons why currencies may change if the exchange rate is freely floating. One common reason is inflation, which also shows up in MCQs and data responses a lot. If your country has an inflation problem, and your inflation rates are higher and higher and higher every year, more than the global average, more than your trading partners, your country's goods and services are becoming more and more and more expensive due to inflation. How does this affect your exchange rate? Well, let's take a look. If your goods and services, UK produced goods and services, are becoming more expensive, US citizens will not want to buy them. I don't want to buy these goods from the UK, they're just too expensive now. I'm not importing from them anymore. <clears throat> UK's exports are going to suffer, and if UK's exports suffer, this curve will shift downwards. People will not demand the pound anymore because they don't want to buy goods and services from the UK any longer. Similarly, People who are living in the UK, UK residents who are earlier, let's say for example, buying locally produced UK goods. These locally goods, produced goods are becoming more and more and more expensive. Suddenly US produced goods are looking like an alternative, like a good alternative because they're relatively cheaper. Home produced goods are becoming more expensive due to inflation. So imported items suddenly seem a whole lot cheaper. So UK residents will start buying more goods from the US because it's relatively cheaper for them to do so. When they do that, they will be supplying more of their currency. You supply your currency when you want to buy goods and services from other countries. I will supply more of my currency if I want to buy more goods and services from other countries. So the supply of this curve is going to shift outwards. More of my currency is going to be available on the forex market as I am trying to buy more goods and services from the US. The combination of these two things and I want to make sure you're comfortable with this term. The combination of these two things will do what to my exchange rate? I want to, I hope you guys are following over here. My exchange rate was up here, now it's become lower. So what will happen to the UK's exchange rate? What will happen to the pound? It will depreciate. Okay, so this is how your MCQs will be phrased. The UK's inflation rate is higher than that of its trading partners. What will happen to UK's currency or to the pound? And the answer will be depreciate. Or you will have to identify the correct diagram. Okay, I am going to spend a little more time on this one because again, once you understand one of them, the rest of them are easy to understand. But in order to understand this, you need to know why there's a demand for a currency, why there's a supply of the currency, who is demanding it, who is supplying it, and why might that change? So the first thing over here is that UK's inflation rate is very high. If UK prices of UK produced goods and services are becoming more and more and more expensive, people from the US will not want to buy them. They were earlier buying items from the UK, let's say they were buying strawberries from the UK, but these strawberries are getting more and more and more and more and more and more expensive, they'll say forget it, we don't want to buy anymore, it's becoming too expensive for us. So as a result, if they're not buying it, they will be demanding less of the currency. If you are demanding less goods and services from the UK, you will be demanding less of their currency as well. This curve shifts inwards. Um, similarly, let's say I was sitting in the UK and I used to buy a local um, cheese, which was quite cheap and I like my UK produced local cheese. This cheese is becoming more and more and more and more and more and more and more expensive because of inflation. I say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to buy this local cheese anymore, I'm going to buy the cheese from America, it's much cheaper. Okay, because American goods now seem cheaper, their inflation rate is not so bad. So I start buying more goods and services from the US. To buy more goods and services from the US, I need to supply more of my currency. To buy more goods and services from the US, I have to go to the forex market, supply my currency and buy the dollar instead. So I will be supplying more of my currency, this curve shifts outward, the combination of these two is to depreciate my currency. Um, on your own, if you like, what would, would, would be nice, which I always recommend, and in class this is what we do, um, I recommend you do the opposite. 
What happens if UK's inflation rates are lower? What if every other country is experiencing massive rates of inflation, but the UK is not? The UK inflation rate is much lower than the global average. Reverse these curves and see what might happen. So you're welcome to pause the video and do that because your MCQs will always be both ways. Okay? So again, remember, keep pausing, keep making sure you have the diagrams and everything is complete. I'll be moving on to the video, but I would like you to pause. All right, number two changes in relative incomes. Uh, we have two cases over here, and the two cases are going to um, <clears throat> the two cases are going to have different effects. So please make sure you do so you understand this. Um, in the first case, U.S. incomes rise. So in the first case we have over here is that everything such as parameters remains the same, but in the U.S. incomes are going to rise. So this is quite interesting. I'm sitting in the UK. Nothing has changed in my country, but people in America are becoming richer. If people in America are becoming richer, they will buy more of all goods and services, including goods and services from my country. Think about what I'm saying. This is the UK, we're sitting in here, nothing has changed in our country. Next door is the US. Those guys start becoming richer and richer and richer and richer. There's a boom going on in the US. So those guys will now start, start buying more of all goods and services, including stuff that is made in our country. So as a result, they are going to buy more goods and services from the UK because their incomes have risen. This demand curve will shift outwards. This demand curve is going to shift outwards. Because they'll take more holidays to the UK, for example, buy more important items from the UK, so they will start demanding more pounds in order to buy these items. If US incomes rise, think about this, it's quite interesting. Centrus Paracus, I'm sitting in my country, I haven't changed anything. US incomes rise, and as a result of international trade, and then buy more of my goods and services, the demand for my currency rise, rises and my currency can and will appreciate. The UK might find an appreciation in its currency if US income start to rise. Okay, only one curve will be affected because central spiral is nothing is happening in my own country as yet. Okay, so my supply is not changing, but the demand for my currency is going up. Um, similarly, if we come to this side, when we are experiencing a boom, UK is experiencing a boom. It's in our class where incomes are rising, 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 rising. And we've already discussed this many times before in macro. If you experience a boom, you will consume more of all goods and services, including important goods and services. If you start experiencing a boom, you will start consuming more of all goods and services, including imports. A booming economy is often noted with a lot of international travel, not now in the time of Corona, but generally a lot of international travel, people taking vacations, holidays, spending a lot of money. So we will start consuming a lot more goods and services from abroad. And here's this is what's interesting. By doing so, by buying more goods and services from other countries, we will be supplying more of our currency. By buying goods and services from other countries, we will be supplying more of our currency, actually possibly causing our exchange rate to depreciate. Think about this, it's so interesting. We've mentioned, we were mentioning this before when we did balance of payments as well. Your current account can go into a deficit when you are in a booming, when your country is booming. As your country is booming and incomes are rising, they are importing more goods and services from other countries. We've already thought that this may cause a balance of payments deficit as we are importing more and more from other countries because our national income is rising so high. Not only will it cause your current account to go into a temporary deficit, but it may also depreciate your exchange rate to some extent. It may also depreciate your exchange rate to some extent of your currency on the forex market in order, to, uh, in order to import from other countries. So um, this one is different in the sense that only one curve is shifting at one time. So if you get changes in relative incomes, please note that only one curve is shifting at one time. If US income rise, the demand for pound rises, our currency appreciates, as in the UK. If UK incomes rise, then actually the supply of our currency increases, causing our exchange rate to depreciate. So interesting point, because we've seen this a little bit in the balance of payments, your boom may not actually be the best thing for your balance of payments and your currency may also start depreciating as you're supplying more and more of this currency onto the forex market, hence pushing down its value. So guys, I would just here where it says two great changes in relative incomes, two cases, US incomes rise, UK incomes rise, you will fill out these two diagrams. All right, remember to pause the video and continue to do this, please. 
Uh, number three, changes in relative interest rates, return on money. Sorry, there's a typo here. I should say return on money put in banks, not out in banks. Return on money put in banks. We can change that. There's a typo. Um, maybe we can change it before we give it to them. Okay. So changes in relative interest rates, return on money put in banks. Uh, I'd like you to put a star on this one because this one is a little bit important and a lot of MCQs do deal with this. Interest rates. Um, so I put my money in a bank and I receive a rate of interest from the bank. The example I'm giving here is that UK interest rates are higher. So I really want you to think about this. And this has to do with the hot money we've discussed already in balance of payments. The rest of the world is offering, for example, a 6% return on money. The UK ups the return on money to 8%. So now if you put your money into a UK bank, as opposed to any other bank in the world, you will get a higher rate of return. The UK offers an 8% rate of return versus the rest of the world who's offering a 6% rate. So UK interest rates are high. The demand for the pound is going to increase. More and more people will want to put their money into UK banks because UK banks are now offering a much higher rate of return. Similarly, and this is important, see if you can figure out why, the supply of the currency is going to fall. The supply of the currency is going to fall and this is why international centers, for example, investment banks and people who deal with a lot of money will not, or let's say UK banks who are like investment banks, will not want to put their money abroad. They would rather keep their money at home and not send it out of the country. So the supply of pounds is going to be less on the forex market. Let me repeat this. The UK is offering a higher rate of return. Now you and I will have small, small transfers of money, but here we're talking about larger institutions, such, such as uh, investment banks, who are constantly moving money from one place to the other to take advantage of different interest rates and exchange rates, for example. Okay, And this term has been given to you in the balance of payments. Um, you are the head of some, or you are an investment banker with millions of dollars at your disposal. UK is offering a higher rate of return than anywhere else. The demand for the pound is going to increase. People from all over the world will want to send their money to UK banks because UK banks are offering a higher return. Similarly, those sitting in the UK will not want to send their money to other countries. I was thinking of sending my money to Switzerland. No, I'm going to keep it in the UK now. So the supply of pounds on the forex market is going to go down as people in the UK and investment banks in the UK will keep their money within their economy within their borders as opposed to sending it out to other banks. So supply of the pounds on the forex market will go down, causing your currency to appreciate. Okay, this is going to cause an appreciation of the currency. A really important thing to understand, which we're going to use later, your interest rate will also affect your uh, exchange rate market. Remember, interest rates are monetary policy. Your interest rate also has an effect on your exchange rate market. Increasing your interest rate will cause your currency to appreciate. And therefore, very obvious to see, if you lower your interest rate, or other countries offer a higher rate of interest than you, I, let's say the UK is offering 6%, other countries are offering 10%. What might happen to UK's currency, or what will happen rather, UK's currency is going to depreciate. Why? Less people will demand the pound, more people will supply the pound. If I have my money in pounds, I'd rather send it to Switzerland or some other country which is offering a higher rate of return. So the supply of pounds will increase onto the forex market. The demand for pounds is going to fall on the forex market, hence causing my currency to depreciate. Um, I really want you to understand this. Um, changing the interest rate will have an effect on the currency. Increasing interest rates will cause the currency to appreciate. You're welcome to draw this diagram out. If you lower your interest rate, the demand for pounds, let's see why this happens. If you lower your interest rate, there'll be a reduction in demand for pounds, thus an increase in supply of pounds, which will cause your currency to depreciate. Reduction in demand, increase in supply, these conditions cause your currency to depreciate. Spend a moment here. Spend a moment understanding interest rates, rewind it and listen to it again please because this one shows up a lot in MCQs and it also shows you the link between monetary policy and your exchange rate, Okay, which is something that we will discuss even further in the handout. So do pause over here, do rewind, make sure you understand this, changing your interest rate will affect your exchange rate as well. Um, I'm not giving you a diagram for changes in relative investment prospects. 
Uh, what do I mean by investment prospects? Better infrastructure, maybe a better tax regime, anything which makes your country seem like a good place to invest in. Political stability, better infrastructure, uh, educated uh, workforce that can handle machinery, etc. etc. All of this comes under the realm of investment prospects. I haven't seen many MCQs about this, but in case you want to put it into an answer. Um, it's really straightforward. If UK's investment prospects improve, then people will want to invest in the UK, the demand for pounds will increase. UK residents will not want to send their money abroad, they'd rather invest in their own country. Supply will drop, pound will appreciate. Similarly, let's say the UK investment prospects worsen, uh, possibly um, like happens to a lot of our countries, political instability, a lot of inflation, a lot of uncertainty, strikes, etc., etc. Not a good place to set up a factory, for example. Then the demand for your currency falls. Your own residents would rather invest abroad, so they will be sending more money out of the country, and your currency is going to depreciate. So you can just fill this in, you don't need diagrams over here. Hopefully, you guys should be quite comfortable with the diagrams after drawing so many. Okay? Um, you just make sure you fill this in so you understand. We have speculation as the next one. So this is quite interesting. Um, speculation. If speculation is strong enough, it will cause the actual event to take place. Say there is speculation that the pound will lose its value, the pound will weaken, the pound will lose its value by the summer. So imagine this, imagine you're sitting here and everyone says, by the way, you know, right now the pound is floating close to 200 rupees, but by the summer the pound is going to lose all of its value. Trust me, by the summer the pound will be somewhere at 50 rupees a pound by this summer, for example. Okay? Those who want to buy pounds will not buy now and rather rather wait till summer to buy. So think about this. You guys are telling me, oh miss, you know, we're going right now straight from class to buy some pounds. And I say, listen guys, you don't do it now because I've heard a very, very strong rumor that by the summer, the pound is going to lose its value, corona, this, that, so on and so forth. And for some reason, you decide to believe me. And you say, yes, okay, fine. I say, by the summer, the pound will be 50 rupees a pound. Why are you buying it at 200 rupees a pound? You will not buy it. I will say, okay, miss, it doesn't make sense. I'm not going to buy it right now. Definitely not. I would wait until someone to buy it. Already the demand for the currency is dropping. Already the demand for the currency is dropping. Those who wanted to buy the currency, sorry, those who wanted to buy the currency will no longer buy the currency. But let's say there's one person in class who has a lot of pounds. He had bought them earlier for investment purposes and he has a lot of pounds lying around in his locker. And he says, Miss, what are you talking about? I said, Yeah, right now it's 200 rupees a pound. By the summer it's going to be 50 rupees a pound. The first thing someone wanted to do is go and sell his pounds now. He said, run out and say, oh my god, because I have so many pounds, I was keeping them for investment purposes, hoping the pound would rise by the summer and then I would sell it. But you're telling me the pound is going to lose its value. Let me get rid of my pounds at this higher rate. Right now it's 200 rupees a pound. By the summer it's going to be 50 rupees a pound. So he would want to sell his pounds now as opposed to later because the money is going to lose its value. So what he's going to end up doing is that he is going to supply more of the currency onto the market. Think about what's happening here. The power of speculation. If speculation is strong enough, or this is the word, strong enough, it has to be something that people believe. If speculation is strong enough, the actual event ends up taking place. Because people work on the speculation as if it is a reality. Let's start this again, okay? People will work on the speculation because they believe that it's the reality. I strongly, and we've discussed speculation many times in class before, but let's apply it to the exchange rate market. I strongly speculate that the pound is going to weaken by the summer. And let's say I was in some position of power where you people started to believe me. I said, no, Miss Manas knows this pound is going to be at 50 rupees a pound by the summer. Those who wanted to buy pounds now will stop buying them. It's too expensive right now, it's at 200 rupees a pound, I'm going to wait till it comes down to 50. The demand for the pound is going to drop. Those who have pounds will want to sell them now. It doesn't make sense to hold on to them when they're going to lose their value so rapidly. Okay, let's quickly sell them now at a higher value of 200. Otherwise, by the summer, they're only going to be worth 50 rupees a pound. So suddenly, they will start selling their pounds. The market will be flooded with people selling their currency. Supply of pounds will increase. This combination of a reduction in demand and an increase in supply will cause the actual event to take place. So this is going to be really important later, but let's read what we have uh, written over here. Say there is speculation that the pound will lose value by the summer. Those who want to buy pounds will not buy now and would rather wait till the summer to buy. This would cause the demand for the currency to shift inwards, reduce. Similarly, those holding on to pounds would rather sell them now at a higher value as compared to later at a lower value. 
the supply of the currency in the forex market would increase. This combination of lower demand and increased supply would actually cause depreciation to take place. What was speculated actually took place because people acted on that information. The power of speculation is very strong. Um, and the final one, guys, no diagram for this changes in long term trading patterns. This has to do with worldwide patterns of trade. Certain countries will enter the international market, while others may start to lose popularity. Um, this can't cover MCQ, but just an understanding that you know, emerging economies, their currencies end up getting a bit stronger because earlier nobody was trading with them. And now they're emerging economies who are taking a part, an active part on the international market. So the value of their currency may start appreciating as more and more people want to buy goods and services from their country. Okay, so guys, um, here are six reasons why a freely floating exchange rate may change. A freely floating exchange rate is one which is um, based solely on demand and supply. And it can, will and does appreciate or depreciate along with these changes. What you see on the board is um, will be tested in MCQs and also possibly data responses. This is the one where CIB uses a lot interest rates changing and we will also use it a bit later as well for fixed exchanges. So do understand the effect of interest rates on exchange rates. Make sure you understand this. Again, um, you're welcome to pause your video and make sure that all of this information is in your. Okay guys, so listen, uh, we seem to have covered a lot today in today's lesson. Uh, background of exchange rates was covered and including uh, in terms of exchange rate regimes we've done freely floating exchange rates and why they may change. Uh, in our next lesson that we're going to record I will tell you uh, the advantages and disadvantages of a freely floating exchange rate and we will also cover mixed and managed flow. So for now I want to stop because I really want you guys to assimilate this information, make sure you really understand it, make sure your notes are up to date and we are then going to proceed in the next lesson on the rest of floating exchange in fixed and managed float.